Good evening and welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy brought to you by Free People Radio and now powered by our first sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us. Help fund the movement, help support the movement. Here at Free People Radio, we do believe in the freedom of movement and freedom of movement is what this establishment wants to take from you. I am your host, Royce White, and I am here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Episode 32, episode 32, and the day is, I'm not even quite sure, it's Friday. It's Friday, but we're filming this on another day, uh, but, but, but it's Friday wherever you are when you're watching this, when it premieres. Um, and today we have none other than the great J, AJ, none other than the great AJ Barker here with us again, back for another conversation, and I'm very excited about that. I couldn't imagine a more uh, well-rounded, uh, well-rounded, well-versed friend, brother, um, and 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 man uh, to have in after after Holy Week, um, and and the observance of of the rising or the risen Christ and the one true living God. Um, I turned 32 this past Monday. Uh, and AJ Barker had a birthday pre uh, recently as well, um, so happy birthday to you! Yeah, since you, the last time we saw you, you as well. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. And um, we we're, we're glad to have AJ back. Can't wait for you guys to hear the conversation. Without any further ado, the great AJ Barker. Good to see you, man. Good to see you too, buddy. Glad to be back. Yeah. Um, let's let, let, let's go where you want to go this time. Yeah, the great AJ Barker. See, the thing you got to realize about AJ and I's conversations when we call each other up, it just be it'll be anything spontaneously. Uh, we don't really have a set script, and we don't have one today. I knew that I wanted AJ on. I know he's going to give some profound insight on a number of things today. We want to sort of maybe talk about sports and the and sports as a, a microcosm of culture and and society uh, uh, writ large. Um, but I caught so where we were before we started rolling the the mics. Um, I called AJ the other day and I said, you know, l let's talk about this, this idea of annexing Canada and Mexico. And these are things that you and I have discussed before, especially with regards to Mexico for years, for years. Yeah. And, um, it, it popped up on Whitlock last week when he talked about secession and I understand the secession argument. I really yeah. do. Um, but, but ultimately I think I've made a decent point that you have to think about the military implications and the fact that we are in a hostile global political landscape, especially with China, not only from a political standpoint, but certainly a cultural and spiritual one. When you think that the Chinese are actively uh, persecuting and, and, and jailing people who believe in God, if they were here on our shores, it wouldn't be long before us Catholics would surely find ourselves in concentration camps, if not killed, because us Catholics seem to be uh, even a little bit more stout on, on turning to violence to defend our faith, right? That's what the Crusades were about. Uh, the Catholics versus the, the the Muslims there on on the peninsula. Um, what are your thoughts on on? I know you you were you were starting to talk about how sports can be a good microcosm of in in such a situation. Yeah, well, I I mean, first off, I was talking about sports more as a node in the in the the cultural landscape rather than just a mini microcosm of the broader picture. Rather, it's like it's like a a good territory to defend and shore up so that'd be one kind of slight explain tweak that i'd make explain what on it is that uh um, we took the americas not, yeah it's not just looking at sports as a sort of metaphor mm -hmm. so that we can gain insight into what to do globally it's rather saying that no this is actually an important node mm. in the map of cultural institutions it plays a role yeah sports and, as an institution yeah sports it's not even yeah i mean it's when i think about the the cultural landscape and those nodes it's like you know, we've got like a medical apparatus. We've got like uh, a sort of educational apparatus, which trains and raises the young and forms the young. Um, and you've got like a, a manufacturing, sort of writ large manufacturing production, industrial apparatus. Industrial apparatus. Yeah. Um, you have something like a political apparatus and a sport apparatus. And there may be a couple other categories, but we're talking about, you know, something on the range of single digits, not 50 or 100. Right you know, possible significant cultural nodes. Right. And so I, I more have an interest in the sports as one of those nodes, not merely as a metaphor for understanding 
like how to engage in geopolitical warfare or or um i don't know global philosophy or things human philosophy things like that it's like no i think it's actually an important sphere itself and um yeah so that that kind of is is the slight uh rejoinder that i would just make to the the interest in the the sport topic yeah. is that there's an interest in it for itself as well um backing up briefly to the question over you know mexico canada if anyone's wondering i i recall that this first came up with royce and i when that story broke a few years ago about um one of the one of the cartel hitters i mean it wasn't el chapo but it was one of those big players was uh taken into jail by the mexican government and uh the cartel waged uh, a counter oh that was war. el chapo's son yeah it was it, it was okay son. okay yeah, it was one of them son. It was one of them. And the cartel and, backed them and down. The, and the cartel squeezed out yeah. the Mexican government. And it became clear. I remember when Royce and I, when that news happened, I had talked to Royce. I was like, well, it, not just that alone, but the consideration of the cartel influence and the inability to restrain it, and certainly to restrain it beyond our border, has to um, proffer the consideration of military force needed to be used to just stabilize that that circumstance um now the question of uh, america going bigger or going smaller is one that i'm not wedded to one position or the other um i think i, I tend toward the smaller but um me too but i i i i at least again just if i'm looking at the the situation of a interconnected world a more global world um i i I don't think it would necessarily be prudent to cede that territory, kind of like you say, and just you know, say say just secede and and you know, group down and I, you know, especially, in some ways that might leave you a, a sitting target. Well, especially given who we're dealing with and what yeah. we're talking when, about. When you're dealing with uh, grade A bona fide narcissists and psychopaths, yes, um, that that mechanism is is foolhardy. Uh, it's the same thing if if you're dealing with with the demonic in spiritual warfare if you're going to sort of passively win them over with a sort of compromise um you're a fool and uh you're going to quickly be seized by <laughs> by demonic influence right very quickly right right you have to hold up the cross of christ and bring bring that to them well and it's just a, if for me right. for me and you know me well i always look for the contradictions in any narrative that's spun or 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 forwarded and the great contradiction for me as somebody who sits on the conservative side of the political aisle here in the American political culture, it just seems overtly strange to me that the that a, a key position for the conservative movement and for Republican politics has been borders. And to even hear that secession would be an option blatantly concedes the border to a negligible degree when we've not even proven we could handle a border with a with a unified uh, uh, federal government and union. I don't understand why people think we would we would be able to maintain a border of scattered states. Well, and, uh, and I don't know how you to uh, establish a new border next to a people that don't recognize borders. Borders, and even furthermore, how if you if you if you consider that the basis of secession is on the grounds that we are fundamentally different cultures, and that we're basically going to become two different nations, how long until that nation starts to target you? And if you're saying right. that Republicans are seceding from the federal government, who controls the military? Does each state now have a piece of the military? Yeah. I mean, it just gets ridiculous. And, and I mean, the 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 neoliberal apparatus has shown known has shown no uh, self restraint in trying to impose their ideological viewpoint worldwide. So why would they not do it next door to them? No themselves? doubt. No doubt. It's it's ridiculous. And, and listen, I I favor the smaller form of government as well. I do, and and the sort of balkanization, the regional model, something we talk about regularly. We've yeah. mentioned it on yeah. on other. Shows and I said and it on on Whitlock. I said, look, we got to expand. Then then we can balkanize. And I saw people go, well, Balkan. You don't know what balkanize mean. Balkanize is a hostile. Uh, you know, sort of a regionalization or a hostile. No, no, it, it, relax, <laughs> relax, guys. Um, but, but I do think that. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not quite sure how the expanding and balkanizing would coincide. Not that I'm saying the same thing. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's inherently uh, hostile, but um, there is something about it sort of uh, coagulating uh, authority in smaller spheres. And um, I mean, 
yeah, maybe the the a Confederacy model is the right model. I mean, I I think it is the most profound model. I think that's why the United States has the most profound model uh, available today. But uh, we already don't use that. We've already we've um, already given that tarnished up. and yeah. tarred that to an extent that people don't even seriously consider that mechanism of of governance. Which, by the way, we we are a Confederate government. It's not a question of whether the North or the South. No. One, we are where you have states' rights, where where the, the localities hold as much power as they possibly can, and you only defer powers as needed to higher spheres, as not only just needed, but relevant to those spheres. So that's why, you know, when you read the Constitution, the federal powers are basically like uh, imposing tariffs. They're like beyond and 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 waging general wars. Like beyond that, it's like, what do you what else what are you doing? And uh, I know they they then expanded arguments to say that well we have highway systems and we and and the even and prior to that the healthcare. train systems and we have all these things yeah. and they and they require the interaction between these things so now it's the sphere of the federal I mean that's the exact argument they're using for why now we need a sphere on the global um, and it's all, always going to conduce to, toward a sort of an expanse of power. Um, <laughs> In, in, in more political power in smaller locations covering more things and um i mean it it just is it's just tyranny and and sinful at 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 its core it's not a question of whether they're so are they you know mathematically are they right in that it's no it's it's not appropriate it's not <laughs> it's not their responsible sphere of influence at all yeah. it's not people's sphere of influence and and not only is it, it not only does it not only does it tilt towards the t- tyrannical, it tilts towards the uh, the incompetent. Yeah. I mean, it's very, oh, very hard to fun. effectively govern over wide. And this is why when I say, and look, there's the military proposition first, because what humans have showed across time is given the right circumstance and space, they'll try and invade each other and kill each other. And we have no shortage of capacity to do so with today's current military landscape. Now, yeah. The reality is, is that Canada and Mexico are already a part of America. I mean, right. we, we right. underwrite and protect the, the, the nautical sovereignty of the North American landmass is America's to own. It, it, it has been, I mean, we're in the South Pacific Sea just as much as we are in our own ocean. So our Navy, I mean, Canada has a Navy, and, and but what's come the, on. And what's the, the, the backbone of, of the liberal progressive argument put forward today by them? around Mexico is this like trickle down sort of, or bottom up sort of policy. What would they call root cause or something? We have to fix the root causes. Like right. we have to fix Mexico in order to fix immigration. Right. And um, you know, that's like, that's their animating principle right now. No doubt. In the political space. No doubt. And, uh, but then they'll kind say of, if what, we annex, then they're going to take the anti-war position. Right. They'll right. just but, switch. But that's the point is, is like actually the annexation is, congruent with the ethos of what they're getting at it's recognizing that yeah um you know the symptoms won't you can't just fix the symptoms and and cure the problem but um so if we're going to cure the problem let's seriously consider curing the problem rather than you um siphoning off any number of people's money by the way it's not just the rich people's money that's getting siphoned off right uh it's tax season (laughs) and uh (laughs) being uh what what would it be uh um april 14th you know, on this Friday of this airing date of this podcast, uh, taxes are due tomorrow, right? So we all know that um, <laughs> for all of us who who head households and have to file our taxes, that uh, you're getting robbed in, in <laughs> plain daylight, regardless of what bracket you fall into. Right. And um, and so the 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 liberal position is one that says, well, let's hi- help. Let's you know, help solve the root cause by siphoning off your money toward them and toward, and not toward them, toward middle managers that'll further siphon off more of it and nothing will really get to it's them. A complete and then the planet story. will, or the problem will continue on and the racket continues and you have the enriching of individuals, which by the way, anytime a society or culture is breaking down, uh, people start to fend for themselves. And, um, American individualism uh, merged with a collapsing and decaying social and cultural order uh, gives you a nice result of um, rabid narcissistic individuals vying for whatever uh, economic security they can have for themselves. That's what our 
political apparatus is evidently doing because no one's uh, in the ball camp of being like, man, well, I really like the social services that are being offered to me. So whatever uh, uh, gimmick they're selling you, which is, you know, again, social services right. and these things and blah, 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 uh, they're not delivering on them. They're certainly not, not delivering on them in a timely and reliable manner. And uh, so, again, it, it comes down to a point of like, well, okay, we can basically throw that whole um, uh, notion or proposal out, the help the root causes from a distance, and at least maybe consider, uh, yeah, let's recognize those root causes and now let's go to the the primary root I, i'm sorry the primary root cause problem with mexico is the cartel problem and the fact that that cartel problem that car, cartel apparatus is way stronger way more animated uh way more evangelistic <laughs> successful in that effort than uh the mexican gar, uh, government uh either is or ever has been right or ever will be um and it remains to be seen whether uh, even the American government can hold up to that, that uh, the evangelizing uh, nexus of the drug apparatus in our modern world, which um, cocaine problem stronger than the 1980s at the peak of the cocaine problem, heroin problem worse than uh, the peak of the 1970s, which was the peak age of heroin, uh, marijuana worse than the peak of the marijuana problem in the 1960s. Uh, and all of the three are more potent than they were back then. And overdose deaths um, are higher in every single one of those categories uh, accordingly. So, I mean, it, that doesn't even address uh, prescriptions of pharmaceuticals. Fentanyl. Yeah. The big well, and, and pres- but I just mean prescriptions of pharmaceuticals for, um, you know, psychotropic medications as well. So we, we are a society that is thoroughly drugged up. And that means that the cartel has uh, the, the demand necessary for uh, their institution to be well entrenched far into the future. If that's not worth trying to fight and dismantle, and by the way, I'm not even a supply side uh, sort of um, drug, I don't know, drug philosophy thinker either. So I'm not saying, oh, we just got to cure the supply. But no, I know the demand is the the is again the core of the problem. But I know that if you go to Mexico, the core of Mexico's problem is the cartel apparatus. And so if you're going to help Mexicans, you have to do something that's a serious effort to dismantle that cartel well, operation. And, and, and another point to be made in yeah. this whole thing that, again, I, that I really find uh, take offense to is that, that the American government isn't running the Mexican government and cartel already. Yeah. Because we widely probably are. I mean, on, on record, we're, we're definitely involved in some way. The cartel doesn't operate independently like many of us would like. That's portrayed in, um, you know, uh, Republican talking points on Fox News. Oh, the the cartel are just this independent force in Mexico coming to and fro in the board. No, there are Americans taking pay. But first, probably the Democrats who are taking political kickbacks to keep the border open. Number one, I mean, that's right. a big kickback. But but also the military industrial complex that has some type of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it yeah. keeps keeps them relevant. It keeps them relevant. Yeah, it's it's all it's all kickback city, right? It's 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 all a pass or a pass to plate around. And this, and this, I mean, honestly, this gets to the 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 core the core point of of this discussion, many discussions that we've had, which is, um, what is the actual substance of being a person and living in a community? And it's not running a bunch of rackets to keep your circumstance afloat, right? It's contributing in a meaningful way to human community, to human interaction, to uh, goods that bring about uh, actual sort of human progress and flourishing, the enlightenment of the individual, right? I, again, that's through, through education, through training, through work. All those things should be ordained toward that. And by the way, it's not impossible for them to do it. It's not impossible for uh, technology to assist in those things. We just in our fallen sinful nature at every turn that technology has stepped up have utilized it as more of a reason to uh, jump ship on whatever uh, responsibilities we may or may not have. So uh, again, that it gets down to the, that really core question that is sort of um, like super political, even in a way almost super theological and super philosophical. It's just, it's, it's, what are you what are you doing day in and day out what's worth living for and what's the essence of your being yeah what, what yeah. are you yeah there's a there's a, a natural question just to be asked well, let, let's 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 uh take this line for yeah. a second because and this this will be funny there's two things i want to forward to you two things i want to put put to you 
One is, if you can, yeah. let's take the drug thing and, and kind of lay that out because nobody, your, your formal educational training in the beginning was psych, the, sort of in the psychological. And neuroscience. Neuroscience, right. And yeah. then, it became, then, then it became theology, yeah. which is a unique blend. Uh, but you're definitely in the neuroscience, so there's the Sam Harris camp, and then there's us that believe in God, which is the anti Sam Harris camp. If you want to comment yeah. on Sam, feel free to. But, 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 but speak to your Yuval Noah Hararis, who are on the record saying the future is going to produce all these useless people, all these meaningless people, and the only economic model that makes sense is to give them drugs and video games. That's the only. That's the only answer. Uh, and I, I just bring him up because I want to tell the audience that somebody had given me uh, the book Sapiens years, many, many yeah, years yeah. back. Yeah. And I popped up at AJ's house and, and you were <laughs> playing with little Royce, playing baseball, uh, some yard <laughs> baseball out in the, in, in the yard. And uh, I showed you this book. I'm like, you know, what do you think about this book Sapiens? And you were like, oh, dude, that dude's, that dude's an anti-Jew. You didn't say that, but no, you were no, basically dude. like, dude, that dude is the worst, right? I had no clue. Who, I had no clue who he even was. And because you said that, I went and read it, and then later on, you would further tell me about the the um, the decay of that specific to the white culture. And I speak about oh, sure. multicultural issues often, and I I'm fair game. I think with criticism, I criticize blacks the most. You're somebody who, when we talk, you have a healthy criticism of of what whiteness, whatever that means, has become, sure. and what you see pop up across American white culture. Speak to both of those if if you can. Um, the drugs, the you know, Vonda Harari, and how it's become yeah, well, to affect well, first, white people specifically, especially white men. Yeah. Well, first off, and and you'll have to remind me to get back to the white person bridge yeah. after I handle this first part. But let's address the um, the 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 comment from Yuval Noah Harari that you referenced there. I, I haven't seen the source of it, but I'm sure it sounds right in line with something he'd say that uh, the only thing our future is going to be capable of producing is. Uh, you know, people who do drugs and play video games, that they'll have nothing else for them. Uh, first off, let's just pick that apart with some really, really basic common sense, um, which is that uh, all people do not exist in perpetuity in their like 35-year-old self, right? Everyone who has a family, which is everyone, they either come from one or they have one themselves or both, um, uh, has parents that are aging, they themselves are aging, they have kids that are growing, right? Everyone's always sort of in transition phases within life. It's the actual reality of life. So you have people that are, um, again, getting sick and dying, people that are born needing support. You just don't have a sort of blank sea of everyone kind of being in this sort of neutral adult phase where it's a question of whether they economically produce or not. Um, more people than not need our assistance and our help around us right, then uh, need to be a, a sort of economic agent. Um, and for each of us in our own lives, the period of time that we at least hope to be an economic agent is 40 years out of hopefully like an 80-year life, right? right, sort of ideally. So, so even there, now, in, yeah. in any individual's life, they spend, at, if not as much, more time. We could actually then say with weekends and time off, they spend much more time being a, a passive agent than they are an active agent in it. So uh, it's just dumb on the surface to try and equate uh, econo uh, economics in the context of, of someone's production uh, role. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that in a either direct or tacit way, they've accounted for the people that have to be more purely passive, handicapped people, things in that scenario, uh, by trying to just eradicate them from the the system altogether. Old people. Yeah, yeah or old people, right? But uh, the it's children too. You see, a, you see, a sort yeah, of, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But the real the reality, the real reality is, is that uh, living in a community re re requires tending to people's needs because there's not only a lot of people that have needs to be met, but every person at different times in their life has needs to be met. So I just want to say on the outset, the idea of reducing everyone to their sort of uh, productive economic agency is uh, just foolish from a common sense perspective. Uh, you don't need to figure out how an economy works with 100% of the population being active agent nodes. And frankly, uh, you don't have to figure it out with 50%. You have to figure it out with like probably 10 to 15% is probably more of a ballpark percentage uh, if you look at an individual within their lifetime and then how many need to in relation to others, right? Uh, it, it is a smaller piece. 
And so what you really need are, are institutions, like we said, when we laid out those different cultural spheres, you need some people in that manufacturing production, right? Sort of craft building space. And then you need some in that education space. And by the way, the ratio of teachers to students and, you know, administrators to, to students is always going to be lower than the student body because you have more people in the receptive end than the productive end. Right. It's also part of the reason why the principle of education can't just be a utilitarian end of producing because the math doesn't check out. Right. Uh, say you're you're raising people to then be able to teach or things like that. Well, we already said the ratio of teachers to students is uh, very low. It's very small, the number of teachers you need to students. So again, part of the end of that education has to be the, the good of the individual being educated, namely through the acquisition of knowledge and sort of uh, the, the fruits of self-realization that come from that, right? Um, Self-examination. So again, uh, as a teacher, you're well equipped to kind of hopefully speak to that. Hopefully, yeah. right? <laughs> Doesn't hope. guarantee anything, yeah, right. but but yeah, hopefully. And so uh, the, my my point would be is that if you look at any of these and and the manufacturers, they're going to produce you know tenfold the fruits that they that they themselves sort of put into it. So we could say each manufacturer is going to provide resource for ten times the number of people as they are themselves. It's going to be more than that, right? And uh, in government. You don't need a one-to-one -one in government to people being, right. you know, to right. people being governed. Um, and in medicine, you don't need a one-to-one -one in doctors to people being produced. If you add all this up, what <laughs> the only way you solve this picture, believe it or not, and this is kind of a profound realization. I'm, I'm really just kind of crystallizing even clearly right now is that uh, you have the role for families <laughs> and for people being. Uh, bound together in ties that mean something to them and uh, you know honoring of parents so that you have the the older generations with the middle with the younger right y you need that sort of harmony of those things and to the degree well, what that he's really but well, what he's really saying is first what he's really saying is we're going to make it um, extremely unattractive to even have children. So if you can't have children you won't have a family. And yeah you're you, talking about Yuval. Yuval. Yeah yeah he's yeah. saying we'll make it yeah yeah, You're let's not deter have you from a family, yeah. and then let's leave you all alone, and then let's hit you with the reality that we don't need you. Like, well, yeah, because you don't. <laughs> yeah, because you just isolated <laughs> yeah. me in, in an <laughs> yeah. economic perpetuity. Yeah, if we're all yeah. an isolated atom, uh, yeah. we don't need. Isn't it crazy all how people how people pretend like he's so profound <laughs> yeah. with that? You yeah, know, with it's... that. How I mean, it's talk about to, to, from an intellectual standpoint. Somebody who spends a lot of time, who's read a lot, who's who watches a lot and, and, and has genuine insights, spends the time to, to takes the time to have the rigorous insight and, and thought about a lot of these, these issues. What is it like to watch people kowtow to such shoddy philosophy, such shoddy logic? Is it weird? Is it weird well, to teach I, young kids who grow up in a society like that? Like what things do you encounter from kids that are the things they just believe on face value where you're like, this is so off i can't even start to really describe it uh two two things one it gives a, a it creates a very profound space for the workings of grace in one's <laughs> one's life and the the unequal distribution of grace to some people from others you go okay wow um something's at work uh with god where where some people are realizing things beyond just what they've been taught right um, whether they had a teacher or not, they're coming the, to these the realizations. The Holy Spirit is animating in people. Yeah, in yeah. some people, and and different, not types. as much in others. Yeah. I don't, you know, the, as degrees. Christ says, the wind blows where it does. You know, neither where it comes from or where it's going. Um, but it does, and and basically saying, don't, don't worry, don't do the math, <laughs> don't try and figure out who's getting what, and stuff like that. Like you're you're going to be a fool. You're going to be like the person trying to pinpoint the starting location of the wind. It's dumb. Yeah. Um. So, so one, you have that realization of, of the, the role of grace in one's life and one's individual life is very high and a communal life is very high, things like that. Okay. And then on the other end, you, you see that need for um, um, educating people in a way, trying to teach them the things so that from the ground up, they can start to build something. I very rarely look at it and say, oh, this person has a robust thought um, standing where I need to, uh, you know, try and implant a different robust thought. Mm. Uh, it's, there's nothing there. Or there is a very, very cheap thought sort of as a stopgap holding the place so that the whole structure doesn't cave in. Their whole mind doesn't cave in and they just fall into sort of uh, emotional just dysregulation. And, and I don't know, 
the, the, talk, talk about that, ap- that. the absolute decay of their of their I, I, human conscious experience. I don't mean to, I don't mean to get but, you off. Yeah. But look, I got to get you <laughs> to go off into the neuroscience in this way and how the neuroscience from your perspective. I thought you had a very original take on the proliferation of sin in one's life and the contribution to neurosis over the course of one's life or the short period of one's mm, life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and also how drugs and a sort of um, living template, living societal, cultural template, communal template like a Yuval Noah Harari would want plays into that neurosis. Yeah, so actually, and, and we'll take a, a quote here from Fulton Sheen in his Good Friday address, which he played just the other, the other week. Um, uh, he says many people. <laughs> he says many people. Uh, they're not accounting for sin in their life, okay. And he says uh, many of you will, will. Many people will not hesitate to go pay a psychotherapist a lot of money to try and find the different causes to what's going on in their life. And it's not going to be sin. It's going to be how they were raised. It's going to be this thing happened to them. This thing. Okay. Um, the the fundamental thing that he's getting at there in sin is that sin is the disorder that uh, is wrought due to the choices that we make. And by choices that we make, we mean the choices that we like really make that we're like, yeah, I want to do that thing. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, It's not that that person's sitting there going, ah, I know that this is uh, disordered and inordinate and against the eternal law, but I'm choosing to do it anyways. No, they don't do that. They go, I want to do this thing. And then the result is that you have a lot of people doing that. And a lot of those things are inordinate and all hell breaks loose in the wake of it. Right, so not that, really arguable. Society sh- that, proves that. That is the key point that that mm-hmm. Fulton Sheen's getting at is that sin is not just the sort of um, accidental negative uh, outcomes or effects or sort of causes of the the things in your life. Sin is the deliberate, distorted acts that you voluntarily make, and they're distorted uh, because your your nature is deformed either through your previous sin or in the case of the big picture overall, the original sin of, of the first human, right, who endowed with the gifts of intellect, rightfully had the authority for the species, okay? Um, if you're wondering why he rightly had the authority for the species, uh, any immaterial creature, creature like an angel, uh, doesn't have to reproduce. So they're not individuated within a species. The whole species is just each individual angel. Um, in any material species, all right, they're individuated by material propagation. Space. That's the way they continue on. You got to slow slow down now. My my I, audience my audience is deep, but you got to you got to walk I believe us it. through that. I believe it. But I get it, but you, I'm just I'm, I know what they're going to say. That was heavy and it was quick. Yeah. Yeah. Angels angels do not reproduce. Therefore They're not material, they so not they material. don't they they're not material, so they don't have to reproduce. Mm-hmm. Any species that is material is going to continue on by reproducing. All right. We are a material species. What that means is that the first individual in the line holds the rightful authority of all the ones that come after them. Just like if any angel sins, they rightfully incur, incur the fallen reality of them becoming a, a, what we would then call a demon. Mm-hmm. Right? They right, because it's, it accounts for them. You would say it, in the in the individual in the material species. Uh, the in the individual that holds that authority is the first one okay after that we're we're in the species by participation all right so this is a long and short of me saying that uh sin begets more sin and it's either sin in your life that begets your own confusion on why you're going after the things you're going after or or it's the sin of adam which is a just cause for you to be screwed on account of it that was the whole point of what I was saying, mm-hmm. is that it is just if Adam sins and distorts sort of human nature, all right, um, that you receive the effects of it, if even though you didn't do it. If you're a byproduct yep. of Adam's sin, yep. that the, the punishment that you so, incur is still still just. Yeah, it's not even saying the same thing as like, oh, if, you're, if your parent sins, then you incur it, which to a degree, they, are, they would always say... Uh, to a degree that a parent's sin arises from bad habits, you're more likely to catch that sin because you're going to be exposed to those habits and you're more likely to habituate in the same right, way yourself. Right. That's not the same thing as the justness of incurring the effects of sin from Adam's sin, all right? Which is more total. Okay, so so long, long, long story short is that uh, 
we sin because our 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 intellects are distorted to such a degree that we just go after the things we want and we don't care and that's what we want and so we go do it and when you have a lot of people doing that you have a lot of sin going on right and that's the the prominent cause of of trouble in society so remind me again how are we weaving that in with uh with drugs what was the question oh how does sin yeah so sin leads to the to the leads to neurosis, neurosis. okay yes through through just going at purely going after your own desires yeah you know no okay concern. so sin so sin all right yeah no that's good okay so sin right is the the thing that i was getting out first sin is you trying to do the thing that you want to do mm -hmm. and uh, what you want to do can likely be disordered um because of something in the past you've done or adam right and and now the effect of when you then sin is the further disordering of how you reason about things, how you decide what things you want and don't want, okay? And all of this, as this gets unstable, creates the context of these psychological neuroses, okay? And uh, by the way, if the psychological neuroses uh, then themselves sort of get entrenched and habituated and incentivized and re-incentivized over and over again, you start to leave yourself vulnerable to psychological psychoses which is what occurs when a break in the actual organic framework takes place uh, because that can happen, right? Literally, it's not the case that every single psychosis a person has is because of, you know, congenital, uh, her, you know, hereditary uh, reception of a disposition toward that thing. Like, oh, you were born to be a schizophrenic, so you're a schizophrenic. And, uh, that is even, how we like to paint it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and even if you go to the, psycho even if you go to the, the secular psychological literature, uh, they'll still say, well, it's clearly some combination of uh, environment and uh, and nature. You know, what, what was passed along, this sort of genetic and the environment, which, again, um, really just includes what you choose within your environment, right? But so they go, well, it's some combination. In and, large part. And, I mean, there is the, uh, we're yeah. sitting here and a bomb goes off and I have, and I start to have yet, traumatic, yet. yeah. Well, the, the bomb goes off. I guess it depends on how close you are to the bomb, but yeah. you won't have uh, neuroses or psychoses. You, no. You'll be dead. No, no, I'm uh, saying, but, but no, I mean, if you survive a traumatic event, um, yeah. there, there is some, some that's sort of that organic uh, fracturing of the mind that can happen, right? Yeah, I mean, if you want to get deep enough about it, um, even that, uh, there can be a, a, a sinful worldview, some sort of break from the way that God no sees doubt. and understands no the world such that you're overprising your own life, right? You, you could disproportionately be overprising your own life. Mm. You could not be seeing the, the mechanics of, of justice rightly. You could not be seeing uh, the role of suffering rightly and you even, even happenstance be... tragedy yeah. rightly. Yeah. And so these are all sort of worldviews a person can hold that um, are themselves a the break. Way they deal with trauma. Yeah, that would affect the way they deal from trauma, and they're a break from the God worldview that God gave to all things, sowed in the nature of all things, and which, when in alignment with um, those, you're now not going to have that same uh, relationship to trauma and post-traumatic, you know, traumatic sort of uh, patterns. Uh, by the way, th me laying that out isn't me saying all my worldviews are good to go no that's the that's the role of you know self-examination confession things like that is that it's this ongoing process to try and dig up where are my worldviews uh separating me from god where are my actions separating me from god where are my worldviews separating me from god where i lose the hope of life everlasting where i lose the hope of god and the charity the love of my neighbor for the sake of loving god and love of god for the sake of loving God himself ultimately, right? What things are standing in the way from, from me doing that? Because uh, it, it can be said logically that if all those things were in line, uh, it, it would be a, an experientially uh, good life to live, right? Like it would, it would in a way be flawless. Um, and um, Yeah, we, we lie to ourselves so much. Yeah. I mean, I watch this all the time. And, and now for the final piece, speak, speak to the, the, the sort of um, uniqueness of, of, of white culture that's been decayed in the, in the country because the, the sort of Christian ethos of just the basic Ten Commandments, that the, living by the Ten Commandments yeah. alone, let alone, let's just take Christ out of it. And I say that with, with a, a fraught bit of little heresy in there, but I'm just saying, Let's just live by the commandments. If you just took the commandments, why are so many people trying to act like that would 
that that provides a, a worse society to live in or more chaotic society. I don't understand it. And it seems to be a predominantly white atheist thing. And as I said the last podcast, you were the one who kind of tipped me off to white atheism. And I'm like, dude, there's no way this. And now I'm looking up and the whole world is opting for a, a, a post colonial, post Christian AI, China based, non religious society globally. Yeah. Um, Everybody, even the Muslims, not just white people, but, but it kind of, it kind of got its going in, you know, secular white Europe. And then it was America sort of monopolizing and then commercializing white liberalism as a political. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, this, the starting point is the universal recognition that, um, people that thrive or excel to one degree or another are left into a um a different prospect for the the coming centuries uh after their success or thriving whether they're white or anything else uh and and many plagues seem to come about people that get settled into that place and so our modern world happens to be one in which the the most recent sort of um widely sort of marked uh affluence came through the white society yeah right and and that's from the industrial revolution to the technology we have today i mean it it's it's sprang board from there i it's not to me that's not a sign of a sort of supremacism it's just a statement of historical fact and observation that there you see the rise of these things and then the decay that took place in that white culture is not unrelated to that it's uh, a direct manifestation of it and it's those things like the sort of apathy the sort of what everything they critique in the bourgeois sensibilities, right? Which uh, the you know the French, the white people were on to pretty early on with this is like what's going on to our in our societies? The sort of decadence, the excessive uh, opulence and luxury, the sort of lack of of care. These sort of weird uh, uh, the, these weird deformed uh, virtues that start to arise. Mm -hmm within a society. So things they claim are virtues are like good habits and good dispositions are very weird are definitely not that. Um, but they very much tailor to a sort of, uh, you know, dinner party wine society sort of lifestyle. Mm. Right. And this is what, by the way, this is what people <laughs> are getting at when they, when they, when they, a crit dinner party yeah. wine, lifestyle. <laughs> wine society <laughs> lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, this is what people are getting at when they critique white people and they say, um, yeah, you know, you can't relate to the struggles of other people because for for white people, their struggles are that they had Thanksgiving dinner and, um, you know, an uncle and uh, a grandma and a nephew didn't get along. And it was really, really uh, emotionally and societally disturbing and painful, right? And those are white people problems, right? Dude, stop. No, but the point is, is like that. No, seriously, yeah. is that a real reference? <laughs> yeah, of course. Tanner, is that a real reference? Of course. I mean, those are those are catastrophes. No. In their in their sort of worlds in their lives. I mean, what? Look at reality TV. This is a wow. This is an that offshoot. Just hit my head. Yeah, that just hit me like reality a bomb. TV is an offshoot of that sort of decadent, decadent, opulent society wow. that sits there and goes, "This is the worst thing going on." Is that the Kardashians, this thing or whatever, yeah, this thing or whatever my, happened. My yeah. half brother, yeah, yeah, don't really see eye this to is eye what, on. This is why why anyone who enters into that, <laughs> into enters into that opulence and that that luxury and that sort of, um, <laughs> the the spoiling of the fruits, the disconnection from from the things that make whatever the fruits are to just the fruits and just taking them in and indulging them quickly falls into that. They adopt the same values. When people talk about like this is whiteness spreading to it, no, they're talking about this is like opulent virtue, the the new the new virtues that come with opulent society and the sort of excessive. And it society. could be anybody. It just so happen happens that this is happening all over mm -hmm. the place. And maybe yeah, all over maybe the place. each group would manifest slightly different ticks depending on other different cultural sort of things. This is where we've talked about uh, white people probably due to continental philosophy of the post enlightenment era also decide to bring with their opulence this sort of um neuter dumb philosophizing that was totally kind of mathematical and abstract and you get all these weird sort of threads and this sort of no, this sort no, of atheism and explain no go go yeah, ahead. i mean i'm go just I, I mean i'm just kind of throwing it 
throwing the stuff out there, but it's like, you're drawing, like, how do we make sense of all these different threads of sort of uh, assurance and conviction that we see in white society today, which is that uh, it's much more valuable to be like a good economic um, agent or person, or even like a, a, a good dinner guest um, than it is to, to have reverence for God, right? To fall down on one's knees, striking their breast and, and plead before God for forgiveness and for alignment with God. How, how does it happen that, that those values, right? Uh, penance is like the worst value ever in white society, but it's most evidently the best, one of the best values there are. Penance, a desire to make up for the wrongs you've committed, right? To actually do things to set right the, the wrongs you've done. Uh, a side note on penance, because it's kind of funny. I was watching the Kobe Bryant documentary Muse mm-hmm. that he made, mm-hmm. and he talks about his, his four air balls uh, in the first playoff game. And he goes home, and he, the plane lands, and at 2 in the morning, he goes and has local high school opened up, and he shoots shots for the next 18 hours till the end of the day, then he goes home and sleeps. That's penance. He was making up. It, he had to account, atone, for the wrong that he did, that he experienced himself to, he fell into that place. He goes, okay, so much is wrong. It wasn't just that I missed those shots and then I missed more. Like, yes, I needed to keep taking them, but also like something I was off on, on something. What, whatever the last trajectory of the last few months my, of that my season had done was off. Was off. He yeah. goes, I'm going to go shoot shots for 18 hours. And what did he do? He, he atoned for it. He said, okay, phew, I can rest now. And what happens? Year two, he comes out. And he's yeah, a wash banshee. Dishes. He's wash a, dishes yeah, until, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a banshee now, and he tears up the league. Penance is a great natural virtue. That's kind of like in, a, in an Eastern culture philosophy. That's kind of like the, the motif of Mr. Miyagi breaking Daniel's son of his yeah. of his own ego and his yeah. own his own with view penance. of himself with regular chores. Yeah, with it's kind of like why parents give kids chores. Like it's no, a good reason to. Yeah, you're not too good to have to clean your own room, or yeah. let alone take out the garbage or clean the dishes that you eat off of. Yeah, it's just kind of like bringing you into reality. Yeah, and you're saying a lot of white cultures just lost that. Any opulent, opulent any system. opulent culture first starts to hate penance, right? They first start to hate. I mean, uh, a conviction of of sin is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, most white people today who are a, a moniker, a stand-in for opulent culture, right, will, will come in and say, oh, that seems like a pretty brutal way to characterize the Holy Spirit. You know, conviction of sin? Like, what do you mean? Like, I, that's not, the Holy Spirit's not trying to do that. The Holy Spirit's trying to make you feel good where you are. No, that's what an, an opulent, decadent person would think, would hope that the Holy Spirit wants to do. The reality is that the Holy Spirit desires uh, you loving God, <laughs> and that's going to require the, the rightful recognition of your place, your humility in relation to God. So I back up. You say, you know, we have all these, these threads of sort of mathematical perfectionism, uh, logical posit- positivism, uh, a sort of um, kosher uh, uh, atheism that is, is both politically acceptable and expedient. And um, what I'm saying is that, yeah, it's, it's, it comes in the wake of the sort of white European opulence that um, has these certain, these characteristics, these identifiable characteristics mm. that people point to and, and rightfully um, know viscerally are absurd. That's why white people are ashamed of it, which is also a healthy response, believe it or not. It's just then they don't take their shame in the right direction. Because they don't have it. Because they don't they don't actually understand shame. They don't actually believe that repentance. That, yeah, they don't actually believe yeah. that shame is a mechanism to bring about your good. They see shame as something to get rid of too. So they go and obfuscate. Yeah. In well and in another vicious habit, go and and just start de- deferring Drugs. to and but no, I'm I'm saying in this case, I'm saying they start sort of adulating the group that's telling them that they're shameful. That's like the dumbest response you could have. Explain. We're also, well, they, they start to idolize uh, groups that don't have the opulence. Oh, you right? mean like minority groups? Yeah, yeah. No, they idolize them. Or, yeah. or, or, or in, in most, well, in white culture in America, it's white men taking their shame and then turning it into beta males because white women criticize them for their shame. Yeah, but who are the, who are the torchbearers of, of the minority adulation? White women. White women. Right, because they, they can't process 
uh, the topic of guilt. And so when you bring whiteness before them, which Talk is... Talk about why women can't... Pro- no, I'm just... No, yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with, with them in particular. I mean, without getting into many other layers of deeper consideration, that yeah. would be legit considerations to, to take. But, yeah. but to continue on this thread, right? Um, so you have the sort of the opulent ethic which is a deformed, disordered ethic, which we're mapping white people onto. When that is brought before white people, many white people are ashamed of it, right? Rightfully so, because it's sort of a pathetic, shameful reality. They go, yep, I, I did that. I did all that stuff, right? But they have such a disordered view of guilt and repentance and penance that even the penances they try and do become a sort of showmanship you know, speaking to the Sermon on the Mount of those who give alms in public public, so they can seek the reward of others, mm-hmm. right? And those who pray in public. These are all their ways of saying, hey, I'm sorry. Make sure everyone knows that I'm sorry. So here's me posting a picture of an all-black box or whatever the thing would be. When in reality, what they need to do is recognize, yes, uh, the predicament that these people have highlighted is a shameful predicament, but to punt on penance is exactly the wrong route. And to deform your penance... Uh, is a bad route number two to take, D- distortion number two. It's a fast track to drug use and then psychosis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Drug use goes right in line with a hatred of, of suffering and penance. Talk about that, because you, yeah, yeah. you used to you know smoke marijuana. Yeah, because I, wanted, because I wanted to avoid suffering, right? I, that was the, the raison d'etre of, of smoking and that's marijuana. Right and that's for everyone. To go, that's to go back to the beginning, though, that's right in alignment with what Yuval Noah Harari is recommending or prescribing for a society that's become radically detached from God yeah. and, and we're going to drug you and give you something to keep your, your time busy. Yeah, because Yuval Noah Harari can't uh, himself encounter the idea of suffering and penance as a good, right? Uh, because um, the, the list of things that he'd have to start atoning for are, are long and many, you know, and probably central to well, he actually his very made the, life. Tell me what you think about this. He actually made the claim I saw once that that the the best measurement, the best metric for reality being reality is suffering. That reality itself just boils yeah, down. Yeah, but he hates that fact. But he hates that fact. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, you can't avoid it. Right. Right. I mean, that's the, the, the we talked about last time, the Buddhist, uh, four noble truths. Life is suffering. Life is suffering. Uh, but then what's their response to it? There's causes of suffering and you can get out of it. <laughs> that's the second and third truths, <laughs> right? No, no. That's the disordered response to the reality of suffering. Which is yeah. a significant so difference. Whether you're, jo- the- whether you're Yuval Noah Harari or Jordan Peterson or fill in the gap, fill in the blank, right? They're all going to say that their suffering is this really real component of life. And um, it's the one thing we can point. Well, of course. Uh, but it's the relation you take towards suffering that's going to be transformative or not. And Christ on the cross is, is that transformative uh, answer. It's the only world religion with that answer. That itself is unique enough. If you had like four other major world religions vying for the position of, of the, their crucified leader, it might be really hard to discern and differentiate which one to go with because they'd all be sort of taking on the question of suffering and despair in a sort of analogous way. And uh, which ones the truth? It'd be hard to do. Yeah. But uh, I don't the know. Buddha, God, the God so not the God, same yeah, as, God so set it up that it's, you don't have to pick between that. You don't have to. It's just there's there's one example of a religion where where the person is is both pro, uh, proclaimed to be God and totally suffers and voluntarily suffers and takes it on and dies, all the way to the point of death. Even death on a cross, as St. Paul says, which is meant to be even in the humiliating death, the and most I, humiliating. I, I spent a little bit of time this past week out for Easter Sunday. I actually, many of my Catholic brothers and sisters out there would be, would be a little fraught at this idea. But I spent time at a um, mega church this weekend. I was invited to a mega church for Easter Sunday, um, and I'd never been to a mega church as a Catholic. I've, I've seen them on movies and like. TV stuff like that. I've just seen them. I've never actually been to one. Sure. And I pull up to this thing and it's like a college. It's like two colleges in one little plot. And I'm like, whoa. Uh, it was actually kind of a nice, nice, uh, nice event. And the music was a bit different than we're used to in the Catholic mass and kind of that, that traditional um, mystery. The, the of The organs and stuff. The organs yeah. and, the, and the hymns and all of that. They, they kind of made their own music, which I don't, I don't necessarily uh, disagree with that at all. Um, 
It's actually I mean, nice. Not in principle. Not in principle. No, the music yeah. is actually nice. They had electric guitars and bass, and it was kind of, you know, it had yeah. that. If you know the band, The Fray, that's what. Yeah, you, might, you might be losing me there on uh, sacred music. No, being, I get it. No, no, no. Being, but, uh, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't really recognize it as a real Catholic Easter Mass anyway, because I'm a Catholic. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, there's just that distinction to be made yeah. from the outset. Yeah. But, but anyway, I, the, 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 no, the, but yeah. the pastor, Pastor Troy, uh, he made a, a very, very beautiful explanation of why the resurrection was literal and how important the resurrection yeah. being literal is. Um, yeah. and, and I thought it was, I thought it was an, an incredible insight. Um, but the Buddha story is not the same. No. The Buddha story is not the same. Muhammad's story is not the same. No. Um, Muhammad uh, had his uh, seven early years of sort of, struggle, dispute, people mm -hmm. contesting, and then he had his 20 years of triumph Being a as warlord. a king. Yeah. As a king and warlord. As yeah. a king. And, and the, the most revered and respected person uh, sort of ubiquitously in the territory, which is cool. It's a cool story. Yeah. But it's not the same answer to suffering. No. You're not going to model your life after being uh, the warlord. Well, and, and even the Muslims. And let's talk about this a little connection bit. With it. Let's talk a little bit about this. Yeah. One, and we, we got a little bit of time. Great AJ Barker has to has to get his daughter from uh from daycare or school, so we gotta we gotta cut short. But we're gonna have you back very very soon. We got about thirty minutes. We're not even two two thirty yet. Um, let's talk about this Muslim Muslim deal for a moment, if we can. Yeah, go ahead. Because when the Afghanistan debacle took place, you were one of the few people that I talked to that is conservative that had a completely different take on how the whole thing transpired than the mainstream right wing talking points about the departure from Afghanistan and what the, what the Muslim fundamentalists and Afghani people, or even as a microcosm of Arabs throughout the history of conflict there in the Middle East, what they're really searching, some of them, at least the Taliban yeah. and, and wanting them. Now you got your anti-Muslims and their sellouts and the Saudis, you know, they're, yeah. they're like Muslim by, affiliation only, right? They're not really in it for the faith, in my opinion. They're evident by their alliance with China. Um, but but the Taliban, you were like, I remember calling, you are like, no, these guys are getting it wrong. Like the Taliban, yeah, they may be barbaric, they may be underdeveloped, but these guys want to live a contemplative lifestyle. Talk about how you... Yeah, yeah, I think what I said at the time was just that it's clear that they want... Uh spiritual matters to be at the core of their um organizing principle of their communities and um our society does not want that you know uh right right, right? that's the opulent bourgeois society right that's the the sort of whiteness that's the plague of whiteness which by the way um whiteness of you know circa 2015 and beyond is is just another iteration of opulent decadent society and it's not uh, the whiteness of people from 80 years ago. It's the whiteness of, you know, millennials and Gen Zers uh, today. That's, I mean, that is the continuation of the sort of opulent, again, um, uh, degra degraded sort of cultural ethic. Um, it's the one, it's the, it's the drug culture. It's all those things. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I looked at it and I just said, I, I think, what's clear what's going on there is that you have groups of people that again are not just trying to say they want contemplation to be at the center of their personal life they want it as an organizing principle for their communities and that's uh that's a very just position to hold you you actually this circles all the way back to our question of Yuval Noah Harari and the economic agent and them being in a context of of others who are in need rightfully and others who are in need. And if you isolate yourself off from that, of course, none of this makes sense. None of the world makes sense. Economics doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense. Um, that's the idea that certain people, uh, it, they have a rightful s sort of authority to try and establish an organizing principle for their communities, right? And, and that's what they were trying to do in, in the Middle East. That's what people continue to try and do, and they have the right to try and do it. They have the right to try and, obviously, I mean, even uh, the the neoliberals know that because they try and impose theirs on everyone else. Right. Their organizing principle, the sort of uh, again, how do you explain backhanded maneuver they do? Once their yeah, backhanded yeah. maneuver they do is to try and keep everyone else from being able to have any organizing principles. Um, 
but the the big picture conflict is between whether one will have a sort of contemplative spiritual foundation to their organizing pr principle or a godless secular you know utilitarian organizing principle though that's that the conflict does boil down to it right mm. it's not there is a uh, big picture there's much more in common with islam um any other faith traditions right and even within those we've talked about this but ones that worship god are different than ones that don't worship god um but again you have that versus the the organizing principle of a, the sort of economic agent um the the secular godless uh do what you, do what thou wilt organizing principle those are those are at conflict they're diametrically diametrically opposed and so yeah i don't know i i looked at the afghanistan scenario and i just saw quite i think what's rather clear just that you you have people in the middle east trying to go about establishing it uh, uh their organizing principle around sort of enthusiastic religious faith and the west saying whoa hold on no that's that, uh, that we don't like that, that, that yeah. yeah we don't like that and that's dangerous and uh, i guess it's dangerous in particular because we're going to bring the danger to you um it's dangerous for you to do that not we they would say uh, it's dangerous that they're doing that but what they meant what they meant it's to say dangerous is because we're going to come bring you danger yeah, you this is it. really dangerous for you <laughs> it's weird to be doing yeah it's really weird yeah. uh it's that you know wine society that's like that's like that's the wine society that, that's yeah, hillary clinton saying that's reality tv we we you know we came we you know we saw he died about Gaddafi. yeah right it's like if you behave that way we'll we'll bring the we'll bring yeah. the fire to you so yeah. don't act like that. It's dangerous for you. It's really dangerous <laughs> for you. It's that's <laughs> yeah. weird. Yeah. But but and it also on that on that same thread, talk about that viewpoint that you have about in 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 respect to what you typically hear from the Republican mainstream establishment in the media. Like why is there always a need to qualify Islam separately from the Christianity we say we're forwarding our political fight for here in the conservative side of American politics? If that makes sense. Oh yeah, because I, I mean, the allegiance is is to the the secular neoliberal order uh, before it is to a uh, love of God, Christianity. Yeah, religious God. a religious principle. Yeah, right. If even the religious, for, even for Republicans and conservatives. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's just the. I mean, again, uh, it's like when when we talk about boomers, right? Um, it's it's a uh, we could say that that's a moniker for people who have entered the sort of uh, ossified neurological state of their life, which is 40 to 60 years old, right? Brain grows until 30, it sort of hits its peak at 40, and then it's in decline after that. So when we talk about boomers, we're talking about people who uh, were reared in an opulent bourgeois ethic, they hit 40, and now they're going to 60, and watch what hell breaks loose, right? That's what we're talking about. With Boomer syndrome. Boomers. I mean, that's just... Boomers are the moniker we're putting on to, just like whiteness was right, the moniker we're right, putting on to, right, right. to the bourgeois society. And it's the same reason why you see every other group uh, can't run, can't move fast enough to, to take their place within that same ethic, right? Um, you know, we want to have as much uh, sexual deviance as the white people have. We want to have as, we want to make sure our babies are made in labs, just like white people do. We want to make sure that we're using just as much drugs as white people use. We want to make sure that we're prescribed just as much drugs. Uh, we're going to need universal health care for everyone because um, we're going to have to go to the doctor as much as white people go to the doctor. I, why do people have to go to the doctor so much? It doesn't even make sense to me for the most part. <laughs> it, uh, an occasional checkup would seem to suffice. Uh, and, and as we've talked about in the occasions where someone falls into the camp where they're the one in need, right? It's the role of the community to help account for and by the way the community of the family right to account for that but this idea that a hundred percent of people need that type of care is absurd well that's one thing that the, right but that, that's what everyone else is racing to catch up with we want to make sure that we everything's have, a measurement against white people we want to make sure we have yeah. all the things that white people have yeah. we want to have wine society like white people have yeah we want to make sure that we go on our you know banana boat vacations like white people do, we and want to make sure. But, and they're drawing us into a, a post, a post World War II, po, a post World War II democratic liberal order, global governance through this sort of like 
like this <laughs> this lure. It's like you got you you want to have what we have, but if you don't, it's like we're still oppressing you. Come get <laughs> Come more on. of Satan. If you don't get more of Satan, then it's 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 no measure that we've done our part to adequately distribute the 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 equality yeah. that we so desire. Yeah. Keep it's like the greatest when you really start to look at it at that level. I mean, it doesn't get much more satanic than that. Well, and, it's and literally it's, the story of the Garden of Eden. It's very evangelistic. It's weird how evangelistic demons are. Mm. There's a, a there's I mean, there's a sense in which it makes perfect sense. There's a sense in which it makes no sense right. whatsoever. And one is like, okay, if your suffering is what it is, um, why are you trying to draw everyone else into it? That's the sense where it doesn't make sense. And then there's uh, if your suffering is what it is, and you realize things like uh, um, um, you know, misery loves company. It's not that misery loves company. Everything loves company because company is a, a sort of consoling thing. And so you can see why, oh yeah, they want to draw everyone into it because it's a consolation. Yeah. People who are suffering want consolations, things that, that can bring them through their suffering. They want reaffirmation right? in their misery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this, they, we're, we're these, all miserable. Girl, yeah. I'm miserable too. Yeah, and I always now go to we women have, because let's just, have a consolation. let's just cut straight to it. There's a very effeminized gravity to what we're talking about here as well, and it kind of maps on to the. Well, what's well, it I maps think, on I, to early the it maps on to Genesis and that in the story Adam was not innocent by any means. I mean, it, it, the I always say the crisis of femininity is a failure of masculinity, and I think that's a biblical look at it. That that yeah, Eve it seems to be Eve sort of I, was you know. From a from a sequential standpoint, historically, she kind of pulled Adam along into it, and he failed to put his foot down, and he failed, or you could even argue he failed to be a better guide to his 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 uh his his partner. Some people will say that Genesis is completely faked. I see it all around us today, but but let's talk about the the. I and I think you speak well to this, and I'm comfortable to let you go off on this at this juncture. Is like speak to the 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 more feminized role of the whole thing from a spiritual standpoint and from a maybe a neurotic standpoint. Yeah. So again, the grounding observation is that different perfections or excellences have different defects. So the perfections or excellences of the feminine individual that's psychological, emotional, personal, whatever it is, its defects are going to be different than masculine perfections, excellences, and defects. Okay. Um, the real question becomes, why do we have so many feminine defects in our society today, right? Which explain, is to say, explain. Which is to say, um, uh, a perfection of of femininity is tenderness, right? Rightfully so, rightfully so. I, there's no argument around this. Every single person who's been born today has come from a woman, period, right? You need a definition of what a woman is. It's what every single person has come from, come through and from. There you go. That's what a woman is, right? And um, so with that, it is right that there should be a perfection to that, to that person, the person capable of doing that, right, to have tenderness. Okay, so then what's a defect of that tenderness? Compassion, a sort of overzealous compassion, not compassion itself, right? There's a healthy form of compassion, but an overzealous compassion, right? Um, and pathomania. Yeah, you'll like mm -hmm. this. I was watching the the most redeeming character. I was watching the movie Scarface the other day, and it had been a decade since I watched it. I was watching it. The most redeeming character in the movie Scarface is Tony Montana's mother, because she is the one that he shows up to her home, hasn't seen her in five years, uh, and before he even offers her anything, she's already skeptical of him. And the second he puts money on the table to give to her, she throws it back at, at him and says, you're a bum and you've always been a bum and you're still a bum and get out of my house. I don't want anything to do with you. Right. And, uh, later on, it's just the whole movie is just her telling him that he's a piece of trash to get out of their life. Now, most people in our day and age, we'd go, well, you're the mother. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be champion number one of, of your child. Um, but most people at the same time wouldn't have a problem with what she's doing to Tony Montana because they see what Tony Montana is, is has wrought mm -hmm. the fruits that he's bringing, which are 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 death and yeah. narcissism and he's a criminal. All I mean, but beyond it, I mean, evil it's man, like he's he's drug smuggler, but he's captivating too because 
he seems to be fighting for a sort of uh, integrity and certain principles and things. Uh, when no women, no children. Yeah, when he's mm -hmm. ordered to kill the child, he can't help himself but rage kill the assassin who's going to be killing it and talk trash to him for the next 10 seconds after they're dead. Mm -hmm. He can't help himself but do that. And there's a, a flourish of like, wow, that is some real like grounded sense Inner you know, conflict you know between... the 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 drunk tirade to the the rich wine society where he goes i'm the bad guy you need me he goes because because you guys want to say nothing and lie about everything mm -hmm. he goes i don't have that problem not me that's not my problem you know who i right? am right right he might yeah. be saying he's saying i might have problems but it's not that okay yeah. most redeeming character in that movie is the mom who sees clearly that at bottom of it you're a bum, not because you won't do anything, not because you won't fight for what you want, but because you're wicked. Mm. And uh, you were wicked back when I knew you. You're still wicked today. I don't see any change. And get out of my life. And what what does she have on on her wall? Uh, a beautiful little picture there of Mother Mary holding Jesus. Right, small little house. Nope, I'll work for what I'm gonna have. Mm. I don't want. Don't don't touch me with this money. Santa Maria. Right, a and so. So the, my point is saying that is a feminine perfection that would be not only totally lost in our society today, but would be seen as sort of weird. If a kid came home after having been, uh, let's say, a, a drug user for most of their life, right? And, um, you know, dabbling and dealing here and there, maybe even uh, overtly dealing, doing things like that. Not only that, they're interested in sort of um, conning people for the work that they get. They're interested in, in socially promoting themselves right, over sort of social media, aggrandizing their image to their peers. Um, and they come home, uh, how many mothers would say, uh, you're a bum, you've always been one, and you still are one, and get out. And by the way, I know you're going to ruin my family by you just being here. So you got to go and stay away from Gina, the sister. Which, by the way, what does he do? Ruins her. He does. Ruins her. Yeah. Right? And the mom knew it. And she said it, and she called him on it after she was ruined on account of him. In grand fashion, right. he does, too. Right. And so my point is that a, a, a feminine perfection is tenderness, all right, met with clarity of what, what is the purpose of the tenderness. It is to bring about good. And if it is not bringing about good, you don't extend the tenderness to it. It's not the way people, evolutionary biologists, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson would claim, it's not a tenderness to your in-group. That is not the feminine perfection. Right, which is no, you have tenderness toward your in group, but the out group becomes the the target of your ferocity. No, the feminine perfection is a tenderness ordained toward the good and toward holiness, right? Mm -hmm. And it chastises what is not holy, even if it's its own kid. So, what do we see in our society? We see a uh, an inability to to uh, handle those two poles tenderness and sort of clarity of purpose and firmness so, so sort of tenderness and chastisement they cannot handle it they don't know who to apply it to they don't know what to ordain it toward many women they don't know how to no, women, no 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 i'm saying our society this our is society. this is my point that our society has feminine defects whether you you know, we all don't know how to handle tenderness yeah, and yeah. chastisement. What I'm saying is that what what uh, Which what Tony needed, what Tony needed, mm -hmm. was his mother's perfection to teach him that. Now his father might come through and have a real clear rubric on chastisement, sort of how to how to um, enforce a punishment swiftly, precisely, right, all at once, and to accomplish what it needs to accomplish. That'd be a sort of masculine perfection to not in in administering its punishments just spray them randomly onto anyone or not be effective enough to actually instill the sort of uh, um, fear needed to correct the act, right? Those would both be defects, okay? Which we also have in our society. We don't know how to handle punishment. But the more prominent, the more pronounced defects in our society today are these, are these certain feminine defects, right? And so when you look at that, you have to ask the question of what's going on, right? Why are those taking the reign? Of course, um, one of the main answers which many people have given is that it's quite clear that society is set up for the flourishing of women. Um, the, this sort of Western society, it, it clearly always has been. Um, uh, the, the male priesthood, it's the same way. Uh, clearly, uh, you're, you're seeing it wrong if you think the male priesthood, um, and by the way, the words of our Lord say that, uh, those 
who, who should lead shall serve, right? And the greatest of all leaders should be the greatest of servants. So it's, it's actually the, the male priesthood is a sort of burden for, for the lowest to carry. Why people would jockey position to get into it speaks to a, a demonic inversion of it where they see it as a sort of glorified, aspired to role. Um, but that's what we, we have in our society are all these nodes where they say, well, look at what men, I want that. And I want that. And these are all supposed to be servile, dirty roles, right? Uh, ro being in militaries, why would you want to expand that to, to women? Fighting in wars, handling military operations, that's not a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, uh, some <laughs> unequivocal good that one should start. That is a role of, of service. And uh, people jockeying for those positions in them is is absurd uh, from a natural perspective, but then on that deeper level is clearly coming about from an inversion of, of what it is you're going after, which is they say, oh, who's the one who served the most of all time? Christ. Who's probably the most exalted figure of all time? Christ. Oh, I want the exaltation. So I want that. Mm. What does he say to Peter? Peter? He says to Peter, you can't go where I'm going. You can't bear what I'm going to bear. Shut up, Peter. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on, happy feet. <laughs> Just chill out. Like, you're not coming where I'm going. And uh, by the way, that's a gift from my father that you don't have to. Right? Uh, don't, you, no. Like, that's not. Slow down, Peter. Yeah. yeah. That's not what's going on. Because Peter had the same instinct to go, oh, well, hold on. I'll, I'll be heroic, too. He goes, whoa, 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 that's not what I'm doing here. You think this is valor or something. Uh, by the way, valor rightly understood uh, was intrinsically linked to humility. But now we've abstracted out the sort of glory aspect of it. And that's all we see in valor, mm. right? It's a self-sacrifice, right? In, in the face of death, in particular in the face of death, and in the context of, of battle and war, where you're, where you're subjecting yourself to the possibility of death. Right? That's the actual normal domain of, of war is the possibility of death. Right? And so, again, I look at that and I, I say, what, what's going on in our society that we're taking all these things that in their, in their rightful nature are these sort of um, bad, humbling, servile things, and we're trying to prop them up. And then we're trying to claim that uh, those that the people who have those have been uh, oppressing and ruining other people, and we don't see we don't see masculine defects as the thing pervading our society. We're not uh, <laughs> we're not um, you know uh, advocating for more punishment of of people of criminal people who do things wrong, which would be a sort of uh, a sort of male defect to be like overzealous in sort of universal punishment. Now, they, we might have that sort of, again, that evolutionary biologist take on the feminine perfection, which is in-group versus out-group, so we want to punish our out-group more, right? But that's already a distortion of, of the sort of feminine principle. Yeah. And, no, and no. by the way, all those things are seen as, but the, the other way you know that those aren't the primary virtues people are promoting is because people always say them it, having to rile themselves up into a state of rage. Mm. So when they finally get to the punishment that they want to mete out to other people, they have to, be, they have to feel justified in their anger because they don't feel justified just up front saying it. What are the things they feel justified up front saying? Um, you know, ubiquitous sort of compassion and tenderness. Those things, they don't have to get worked up into a position to, to hold. So that actually tells you which one's primary, which one's secondary. The things you have to get worked up to advocate for are probably secondary, are always sort of secondary. Right. And so our, the, the defects in our site, sure, we have male defects. You got to work, work yourself up to get to them. And then we have the feminine defects. And those are just what we offer on the first course of the meal. Mm. So in, I, conjunction, in, in conjunction with that, we just came from, from Holy Week here. Yeah. And I have to ask you, in, as a parting shot, as a Catholic, as a Catholic convert, your, your feelings about the Blessed Mother Mary, and I, I had a huge argument with the name I won't say, because you won't know the name, not because sure. I don't want to say it, but there's a, a, a gentleman who has a YouTube channel called 
book, chapter, verse. And I invite anybody to go and, and, and uh, find that episode if you can. But we had a, a huge calamitous, calamitous for Internet arguments uh, debate about Catholicism versus Protestantism and, and um, the, the, in their claim, blasphemous worship of Mary. Um, how do you explain Mary to your students? How, do you, how would you explain Mary to somebody who, who didn't know anything about Christianity or Catholicism or the Reformation or any of it? Yeah. Um, I would explain it something like this. Um, Mary is the mother of our Lord. She's the mother of God. Um, and what's been passed down to us robustly uh, by Christians throughout the ages is not just a devotion to Mary, but a sense that the devotion to Mary is is both good and and worth having in one's life, in one's community, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from a from a personal perspective, uh, I would say from a more visceral perspective, I would say uh, anyone trying to ma- mount an argument to uh, <laughs> you know, sort of undermine uh, love of one's mother uh, seems to be on, on, on losing ground. Yeah, um, that's the point I brought up. I, I would say, I would say. Seems if, weird. It's a weird if at place best, to stake an argument yeah, like If that. at best you can be in a place of indifference toward it, that seems at least more sane. Well, that, no, well, the, the argument and to, to, to try and properly represent sure, their sure. argument, it's yeah. that um, Mary in in Catholic tradition, Mary is held in such a high regard. It's almost as though she's in a similar place as Christ or or the the actual idol of of the Roman Catholic well, Church. And part of what they're wounded by is the fact that Mary has a higher place than them. No doubt, and she does. Yeah, and that was his immediate rebuttal. And I saw many people in the comments say the exact same thing that Mary's not higher than anybody. And it was strange because I understand way higher. Well, here, here's you know, way well, more grace. Well, number one, she's highly favored. And my my just juxtaposition to him was, if she's highly favored, then what's its opposite? Is there lowly favored or is there moderately favored? And he was like, no, there's either favored or not favored. I said, well, then she's in a pretty unique class by all well, then, biblical metrics. Then uh, your divine author is superfluous in his language and no. is introducing non-real categories by calling her highly favored. Yeah, which would make your your, your book, sp- chapter, your, verse... Well, and your, yeah. your sola scriptura it's sort of premise defunct. Defunct by... Yeah. by they evil. always say, I mean, it's the same thing when... when I run when into God this said, a lot of Protestants. I don't want to, I don't yeah, want to try sure. and bring my Protestant brothers and sisters out there down because I understand... As as Catholics too, we have to be, we have to own how this sort of reformation happened. There's corruption in the Catholic Church. There's heresy on the Reformation side, but there's corruption in the Catholic Church. Corruption, institutional corruption, always breeds the ground for opportunistic charlatans to pull people away from the righteous part of whatever that institution was. Yeah, so, and it's so like at, America as and well. So at the right? same time, at the same time, we don't have to own it because. Sin is going to end up being no cause, doubt. and the sin is going to be no doubt. the choice of the one uh, deferring against. Well, there's the people thing. that reject sin too. To talk a little bit of so we we handled yeah. Mary. Mary yeah. is the mother of Christ. I mean, if you can't just on face value, yeah, I just know I know that no sort of deeper theological arguments and really, historical yeah. evidence they're not going to mean anything. About? They're not going to mean anything to God. You chose a woman to bear the the son of God. Because by the way, by the way, uh, when I began to believe that Christ was God and, and sought to, to love God as best, not just, uh, it wouldn't just be like, as he says, but as the community of Christians across time have said is fitting and just. That's 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, 100 years ago, et cetera. Right? When I desire to try and say, okay, how have they done that across time, which shows the workings of the Holy Spirit, uh, I didn't come into it by going, we're going to hold Mary up, right? We're going to make sure that she's really in a high place. I just want to make sure we've got our bases correct. And I, but I also didn't come from it being like, okay, well, I believe in God, but let's make sure that the mother has nothing to do with it. Like, let's make sure we keep that out of the picture, right? Okay, continue. No, it's what have they, what have they held up throughout time? What, what devotions, how do you see, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a sane perspective to take. It's a sane, by the way, it's also a charitable one 
where St. Paul says divine charity or love, as people read, love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things, believes all things. It's a charitable approach to see the devotions that spring up across time as the workings of the Holy Spirit, mm. because it means you believe all things, mm. you hope all things. All right. I think I. Think, so so when I see when I see communities yeah. of faithful yeah. holding up a love of Mary across time, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady, Our Lady Guadalupe. of Lords, right? Our across the board at different Marian Santa devotions Maria. at different mm. different eras. Mm -hmm. Um, the the role it had in the the Middle Ages, the, the fall of the Roman Empire, all these things. When I see our the devotions to Our Lady robustly cropping up um, in divine charity, believing all things that are of God, right? Believing all things, hoping all things, right? I look at that and I say, okay, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to. I don't have to turn a, a skeptical eye to it because um, even even when I look on the sinner. Even when I look on the worst of all people, believing all things, enduring all things, hoping all things, right? Even to them, I can look on them with that charity and go, and go, no, there's a, I mean, yeah, there's a, some major disorder going on. And I desire for you to come to the love of God, not yeah. for my sake, yeah, not to prove me right or something yeah. for, for you. Yeah, and, and, and ultimately uh, to show respect to God. The, the, the inter-Christian spat has be, certainly become one of, of, of trying to prove one's own position and not really acknowledging just, I mean, it's just a complete rejection of grace in my opinion. It's become a, a yeah. it's become a, a, a staple of, of Christian, of inter-Christian conflict yeah. uh, culturally, politically. And I think it has real teeth because, you know, ultimately when we ask ourselves, how did this country, uh, lose its ground and its its moral and and ethical and um spiritual matters like where where did it where did it come from um i think what the what the protestant argument has become at least in in today's today's um discourse so far as i can tell is it would seem that they would attempt to allocate the feminine defects that you ascribed to this sort of roman Catholic idolization of Mary, this improper. Of course not. Of course not, because yeah, they wouldn't even they wouldn't have a place for feminine perfections. Right. The whole point is the feminine perfections, and I mean they most certainly. Lord, you never heard me say that feminine defects come from our our Blessed Mother. Right. <laughs> that is not the source. That, that is, I do. Yeah, I'm not on, saying that. It, I do yeah. not think that whatsoever. Right. Yeah, and. That's you know, what you're more likely to get in a Protestant worldview is one in which the, the feminine principle isn't well accounted for. Um, and, and that's a, a, a tragedy when that's the case, because you and I, we both have daughters. And, and anyone and who has mothers. a daughter and mothers, and every single one of us on this earth has a mother, yeah. <laughs> right? And so we, we have a threat to one another. It's actually the opposite. Another. It's actually the perversion of gender fluidity and all of these things come from a lack of account of genuine feminine yeah 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 that's feminine right perspective that's or, right or, or the perspective on the feminine yeah the the root of it is the, the the real perspective not not the feminist perspective but the actual natural order perspective right. on the feminine that the i think the the, the protestant think right. reformation left out um last I, last yeah. to, to 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 head us out i said that last time but we still no, no, have no. some this time is good. yeah um talk to me about confession yeah. The importance of confession, because a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters have a problem with the 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 entire mechanism of confession that I would need. First, I think a lot of them have a problem with the documented corruption of the Catholic Church and then equating that to the need to talk to a well, priest. First, let me ask you, let me spin that your way, because mm -hmm. I'd love I'd love to hear. I actually yeah. don't know your answer to this. Um, what's what's your view of confession? But also like mm -hmm. What's your, what's your, when's the last, let's say this, when's the last time you remember going to a confession? And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but yeah, again, yeah. I think it's, it's um, helpful. My view of confession. Let, let's go to that second. Do you, has it been 15 years? Or confession? You, yeah. When's the last time you think, because, because mm, by the way. Probably about four years ago. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because many Catholics fall into that boat where mm -hmm. um, they might sort of, from a distance defend confession, but they don't see a practical role for it yeah. in their yeah. life, yeah. right? They certainly don't see it as a pressing need. So um, that's already going to be sort of evidently then hard to uh, convince someone of, right? So so my my practice— it was about, I think it was about four years ago. Sure, sure. Mark. 
Yeah, yeah whatever. Again, and my, my view of confession isn't an inquisition. No, you no, know? no, no, no. But my my view of confession will will partly well, it was about three sure, sure. three years ago that that I started to have my own um, I don't want to say doubt of Catholicism, but questions about sure Catholic institutions and the role of and and even though and then I was out of town, I wasn't living here for sure, a time sure. period, so there was that and and um, you know it's. Uh, and then the priest that I was baptized by moved to another parish. Yeah. And I don't know. There's always this weird kind of. Yeah. Yeah. There's this weird kind of thing of, of when you, uh, when you're a Catholic and you grew up at a certain parish and then the priest goes to another parish and it's like, should I go there or should I get with this new guy? <laughs> yeah. Right. It's weird. It's petty. I know it's petty for a Christian no, community. No, no. The matters of the spiritual are much more, much, much more serious and grave than that. But it's something that when you're a human, it kind of just comes into into play yeah, yeah um and i'm sure priests that leave a certain parish for another parish consider things like that like the displays the dis- well they, they don't consider because the bishop is the one who moves them true they're true. not going well, hey, I mean, i'll their, move to that no one no now. i'm not saying they pick yeah, but i'm yeah, saying yeah. in their mind when they oh, get sure. moved yeah, they yeah, think yeah. of like oh yeah, they're yeah, rolling yeah. especially father kevin mcdonough who has been with saint peter claver for three decades yeah i mean yeah. it's just like he was a he was a staple of the community yeah and yeah. then he moved to south minneapolis to a more uh mexican uh, uh, parish and yeah. um, you know probably a, saw they probably saw saw more need of it over there because sure, the one yeah. probably dwindled over in the Frogtown well, area. Yeah, I mean, and you know? it's number of things. The Frogtown areas is a, a, a war zone, but um, anyway, but but my view of confession is that um, it is much harder to tell somebody else your sins. Oh, yeah, it's not even close. Yeah. I mean, and it's not that you can't confess sh- straight to Christ. It's not that you can't pray straight to Christ. Yeah. It's not that you need to say a Hail Mary to to actualize prayer. That's that's not my view of Catholicism. It's not how I was taught. I was baptized yeah. a Catholic. That never was the 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 pitch. It was like, no, you're going to be much less likely to sin if you have to come in here and tell me about it. Yeah. So, I mean, theologically, one of the distinctions they make is that confession is the mechanism for imperfect contrition. Mm-hmm. Perfect contrition is when you're sorry for your sins because of what they've done to God. And when you have perfect contrition, you're absolved, no matter what. It's essentially saying that right. when brought to God, you're absolved. Imperfect contrition is uh, you're sorry for your sins, but not because of what it did to God, but because of some other secondary thing, right. some harm it's done to you or right. to something, whatever, your, your reputation, whatever it would be. Um, and, and by the way, uh, Without a special grace, you can't just desire your sins to be sorry um, to God. And the right way of understanding is that when one is given the grace of perfect contrition, where they're really sorry for what it did to God, uh, almost none of them are at the same time going, yeah, but I don't want a priest to hear it. Because it, it follows from, what follows from, we actually talked about it at the beginning of this conversation, what follows from that confession, a desire to do penance, a conviction of the Holy Spirit wanting to make right with the Lord, mm. wanting to offer yourself up as a vessel of, of his love and his saving reality in your life, right? And to, to, to share that on, to pass it on, to live that out. So um, you have two situations. One, you have imperfect contrition, and then you don't get absolution from God for that. You can think of that philosophically. If you're sorry because uh, that dude over there saw you do it and you think you look bad in that dude's eyes, why would God forgive that, right? And then uh, in the other case, you have perfect contrition. And uh, when you get those, you won't experience a sort of uh, revulsion against confessing your sins. It's one of the beautiful things, if I might reference it, that I always see Jason Whitlock do. What does he always do? He always leads with like publicly confessing his sins. Like, this is what I've done. That is the work of grace acting on someone's soul, right? Um for yeah, Jason's him, a Catholic. He doesn't for know him. It no, and I, it's not about actually. He's a Catholic. For him, but I mean, when he be, talks, I, I can hear the Catholicism yeah. in it. No, but we that can say he this. doesn't. He's not familiar. We with. could say this out of if you gave him a laundry list of Catholic issues mm-hmm. to sort out and dispute, confession would be way down at the bottom of it for True. him. It was the same for me when I became Catholic. That wasn't the one that that wasn't the hurdle I needed to overcome. No, and I only say, but but, but I only no. say it, but no, what I only say it. Because when you look at the discourse around Catholicism versus Protestantism, overwhelmingly, the intermediary role of the priest is what people go to. It's priest 1A and, and Mary 1B 
or yeah, yeah. vice versa. They're interchangeable. Yeah. And that's why I brought both to you. No, and, that's and, that's the prominent, you know, and I'm just, I'm sitting there as right, a Catholic and, and I'm like, no, but the thread, this doesn't even seem like it has teeth. Like, I know the real argument against the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm like, uh, this ain't really even it. Yeah. Like, let's talk about church, West versus church, East. Uh, you know, these are different, you know, historical bases of, like Tim Gordon and I talked about plural, 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 pluralism, and and the effect that had on the on the on the on the church. Um, these Mary and a priest are like not even on the list. Yeah, and no, and the reason everything that I'm saying about it is really just trying to get at this core idea that um, there are many people who want their love of God to be so exclusive that they don't have to love or interact with others. That's a real perennial desire mm. for man is that if I put God high enough, then I can put everyone else beneath me. I, I can just don't have to consider them. And of course, then you have a setup, you're, you're evangelizing for a sort of atomized relationship to God. Everyone's just on their own, but we're all kind of equal and, but whatever, uh, all of these, the, the, hyper intellectualized the, the repulsion. Of yeah. But the repulsion against, uh, confessing to a priest the repulsion against the mary is uh i don't think they're worthy i don't think that priest is worthy of hearing my sins and it's actually not a question whether the priest is worthy of hearing your sins but that gut instinct shows you one that is uh, uh actually sort of uh revulsive against their fellow man and their fellow woman and it is clear to me it is clear to me that uh, when your love of God brings along a humility in relation to other people, a sort of deference toward other people, then that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And when your religious faith brings a repulsion toward other people, whether within the faith or outside of it, right, um, that is a defect. That is a sort of, that is one that, that is a, a faith that's coming uh, wrapped in a bunch of, you know, landmines. Right. And and so the real in, encouragement is not for you to get straight on confession or the priesthood, but try and find the ways where it's like, yeah, in what ways do you not want to be? Home? It probably doesn't start with them. You probably like get in super heated, visceral bouts of irritability and, and contempt and hatred toward your your own parents or your own sibling or your own cousin because guess what most of us have experienced that if all of us have experienced that yeah. um when ross took the dragon ball z yeah, game right, right what was yeah. he thinking yeah so we were so mad again him, that's me. that's ground zero is the irritability against the people that are closest to you in your life where we've talked about the order of charity mm -hmm. that's ground zero and and start to see the love of god as placing on you an obligation to love them tenderly and most of all with a sort of patience and re resolve and that tenderness with a clarity of what's going to run. So we're not saying that you go and endorse whatever someone's doing. We're actually not saying that. But we are saying that you continue to pray for them, especially if they're in your life, right? That you pray for their, their transformation, right? And so I think from there, I just think for a lot of people that are doing that, uh, again, yeah, their disputes with the Catholic Church, Confession and Mary are going to, fall way toward the bottom as a, like, as, I mean, again, for me, it just wasn't, it was never an obstacle I had to overcome. It's part of the reason why I don't talk about it at length. Other people, by the way, if you're really interested, there are other people who have converted who, who were Protestants who had, who had that, um, as a major obstacle and they can speak in more depth because they've been moved more to try and figure out the ins and outs of that answer. Yeah, to you wrestle know, go, with that. go, yep. Go listen to, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn or you know someone someone in that camp um if you want to to hear more thorough answers rebuttals to marry if you're intellectually curious or you're spiritually curious yeah, yeah. um but to me I, I i don't have that sort of devotion god didn't work that dimension in my life and i i try and serve people but i'm not in the illusion that i'm in, that i'm going to be the ser servant to all <laughs> By the way, Mother Mary's much better at that, right? <laughs> just as than a, I am. It just yeah. as an aside, just you know, aside, she's yeah. the intercessor for all before yeah. Christ, who who is there directly uh, with God the Father. So, um, yeah, I always think of it too. If people are wondering, like, you know, praying to saints or praying to Mary, um, I funny analogy came up when I was talking to a friend the other week. Um, 
it's kind of like when you go to try and get a job at an organization, if you know someone who works on the board, you're like, hey, put a word in for me. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you know, like, oh, this is a, this is a good thing to do. So right? He's, he's so, high up. Yeah. He's I high mean, up there. Yeah. He, he's, he knows the person. Yeah. He's got personal, personal relations with, with them. Uh, that's the praying to the saints. It's like, yeah, you can go straight to God. Definitely. But every once in a while, it's nice to be like, hey, I've been praying to God. Hey, will you put a word in for me too? Because yeah. I know you Peter. really know him well. Peter. Peter, yeah. Saint, Saint, fill in the blank. Last you question. Know. Mother Mary, put in a word. La- last one for you. Yeah. And then I'm going to let you plug your, your sub stack and your new book on Amazon. Yeah. Um, but last question for you, because I know Paul was the you know a huge part of your conversion. Yeah. Um, but talk about Peter. A lot of people have contentions yeah. with with the the um, the scripture um, and thou art P- thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna redirect again to a, a Scott Hans name that comes to top of the mind because mm-hmm. um, again don't have a devotion to Saint Peter. Mm-hmm. When I list off my list of saints who I've felt in a devotion kindled in me toward them, uh, Saint Paul's on that list, Saint Augustine's on that list. St. Peter's not, not that I think have, have anything against him, but mm-hmm. it's just not one that has itched at my heart or that I've yeah. found desirous to that's understand. Not, that's I'm, an honest I, I, you know, I'm always interested in um, the dynamic of, of Peter, at least reflecting on this, contemplating on Peter as the chosen sort of leader amongst the apostles. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on what gives someone a sort of... Um, what gives them a sort of visceral uh, sense of leadership. And so I, I've been kind of coming to this place where I kind of imagine Peter as being bigger and stronger than the other apostles, but not just, I, I think there would be a physical stature thing to it, but I also think that there was likely something of a sort of courage, um, again, culturally, things like that, uh, a courage to kind of, you know, deliver the hard news, mm-hmm. to say things. and. Um, you know, I think Paul is, you know, sharp as a whistle. Um, and at times, right, he s- stood up to, to Cephas to his face. Um, th- that's Peter, yeah. by the way. Yeah. And, uh, yep, mm-hmm. yep, to his face. And, uh, you know, he'll, he'll go toe-toe. But I think there's probably something in the natural charisma of Peter that probably was uh, a degree greater. Mm. And so there probably was something, you know, when it comes to James and John and, you know, um, you know, and the different ones, the different apostles, and some were sort of bigger. And others. there probably was something to the charisma of Peter that was on another level. And I always say we kind of we kind of know this growing up with certain people. Um, there are certain people that are kind of chaotic masculine agents. They're just they're strong and tough, and there's something about them, and um, they kind of draw people, men, to them in particular. In, in, a different, in a different way. And mm. it's not just, um, that a lot of men, myself included, um, when, when we do not fully have that, the way some of these real sort of male chaos agents have it, um, we, we maybe desire it or want, or want it or even want to cap as if we are it. Um, but men, they, men know them when they're around them. And um, whether it's, I don't know, Ray Lewis on a football team or something like that, they know, they defer, they fall in line. I, I, I think I constantly kind of find myself reflecting on on that and maybe potentially the relationship of that to Peter. So, I mean, but yeah, beyond that, I, you know, we get, we get scraps. Uh, the Gospels and the, the letters are, are scraps of the whole lives that these people well, yeah. lived. We're, we're, much, yeah. we're much better off turning well, Peter to was it the in, first in prayer. Point. It was the first the, the right. He's, I mean, yeah, he's but, given the keys. He's he yeah. has certain relation, certain conversations recorded to to and with Christ that are are unique and singular. And even the and even the stature. scripture, even the scripture, we have him yeah. even in the Acts of the Apostle resolving the Council of Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, there's just things where it's Matthew, he's and, all. And my argument was in, 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 in Matthew sixteen eighteen. He says a lot of people say that the uh, what what. What, what Christ was saying is that the, the statement of faith that Peter had made um, was the... Gives him the keys. <laughs> well, no, no, no. The, that yeah. Peter had made a, previously made a statement of faith. Yeah, and, he did. You, uh, are the, yeah. you are the Christ, the Son of the living right. God. He says, it's not flesh yeah. and blood that made you and say that. And then what they're saying is that Christ saying, and upon this rock, 
I will build my church is oh, the, yeah upon faith. Yeah, upon faith. Yeah, there's yeah. a good metaphor in that too. Well, by the way. I mean, here's the thing. Faith. Here's faith, what I don't like. Yeah, I mean, there is a good, modern Christians. A good we spend so much that. time arguing about these things, and we sort of bastardize like the 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 brilliance of Christ or God. Like, do we not think that Christ can speak in entendres? Our, our, oh, our, oh, our the divine author, the divine author often does right in every yeah. scripture. There's a human. He meant author. both. He meant yeah. faith, but he but yeah, yeah, he, he yeah. goes out of no, his like, way to I mean, say, yeah. "Thou That's... art Peter. Thou art yeah, rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The, thou art an yeah, example yeah. of that rock, and upon this rock of your faith. But I mean, he makes it explicit that yeah, yeah, it's yeah. you. We'll build. I will build my church. And, and don't worry. Uh, faith will be a cornerstone of entry into the kingdom of heaven. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. It is no right. Doubt. I mean, the letter of the Hebrews. Uh, the bare minimum is you have to believe that God exists and that Absolutely. he rewards those who seek him. That is that um, that there's punishment and reward for the things that you do Absolutely. in this life. Those are the, the two f- fundamental things. So there's no question that um, faith is a cornerstone. But, I mean, we'll say this, the, the cornerstone of faith is charity, love of God for God's sake. Mm-hmm. And only God can, can draw that up out of you, mm-hmm. right? So even if you want to go to the sort of foundational, sort of spiritual cornerstone, that's charity. Right. And that's, by the way, I'm not really interested with how Protestants try and square it. But when you talk about um, faith without works is dead, this isn't an aha moment. It's just saying that's charity working through faith. Right. Right. The, the works are the love. The works is the love of God. It's not like building a house or something. Right. Right. Uh, which is good if, again, if you're doing it out of charity, if you're doing it to try and, um, I don't know. Solidify a spot in heaven. Yeah, or or even just or like for glory of other people. Yeah, or even in a adulation. human or in a human standpoint, you want to siphon off the money of one segment of society well, yeah, yeah. to defect to grift, to yeah. another people, yeah. and then also in building them houses, sort of uh, solidify and you know stop their potential upward mobile growth within that society. Like then it's actually kind of a wicked scheme, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's any number of things that I, I mean. Again, it's just that's Saint Paul, faith, hope, and charity or faith, hope, and love of these three, love is the greatest, right? I mean, so uh, again, uh, it is, it is dynamic enough to say, yeah, that's, that's a good read on it, that upon this rock faith, I will build my church. Like, yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's, that's a good, yeah, no doubt. It's a good read of it. No you doubt. Know? I like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. Great. By the way. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not really got a big argument with yeah, you there. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> it really is. Um, plug the book, plug the sub stack for us before we go. Uh, my sub stacks, uh, Substack backslash AJ Barker, something like that. I will include we'll it in the add link. The link in the bio, and the uh, description, yeah. book that I just wrote is Advanced Christianity. Um, not not so much relevant to the conversation we've had here today. So um, get it or not, that's a sort of side yeah. side interest. But yeah, I like you know I like trying to write write about things on Substack and 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 think about things. You could definitely check me out there if if uh, if you're interested in in doing so. Love love having the the subscribers to to that that circumstance over there but above anything else enjoy being here it's always a, yeah. it's a the great dynamite AJ. dynamite conversation yeah. the great time. aj barker ladies and gentlemen yeah. i hope you enjoyed it i hope you enjoyed this family and friends friday um with the great aj barker please go and subscribe to his sub stack he's a he's a uh sparse on the internet and and, and on social media he's not even on social media mm-hmm. so for the most part, all you have is the Substack to be able to hear his thoughts on things, and his Substack is great. I read it all the time. I have to read his last piece still here. It's queued up, um, but I hope you enjoyed the conversation I, today. Yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and um, also apologies for any threads we maybe didn't uh, end up tying together. I know there was some early on about Yuval yeah. Noah Harari, and we were going to get to. I mean, we, we touched time. on whiteness, but I don't. We got drugs, time. There was stuff. So, uh, yeah. apologies for for those astute listeners out there. Many of you are who will point out that this guy doesn't even finish his thoughts um you got me there there are times when i don't do it i'm, I'm trying i try and track and and tie the threads together but sometimes i do miss them so my apologies oh on, i on could follow end. i could yeah, follow right. but we talk every day so we talk all the time so yeah uh, it's easy for me i hope you guys enjoyed it aj barker thanks yep. for thanks for being here brother See you, my man. Love you. Appreciate it. Love you, too. Happy Holy Week and happy birthday. It was A.J. Barker's birthday yeah, on March. 25th. Feast, March of the, 20th. Uh, Feast of the Annunciation. March 25th, A.J. Barker. Royce White, April yeah. 10th. We're a couple we weeks go. apart. All right, everybody. I appreciate the time today, your viewership today, and in the future. As always, the fight continues. Godspeed. God bless.